and how your brain knows all kinds of things about speakers that you're not aware that your brain knows. And kind of as a corollary to that, what happens if we try to create a speech recognition system? How is our brain better than Siri or Alexa or Tabitha or whatever <laughs> other ones are? <laughs> so we'll start by a quick little demonstration. But before we do this, let me just say a little bit about what spoken language is. It is basically just a whole bunch of acoustic events. So what's happening right now is I'm manipulating the shape of my vocal tract, and that's manipulating the acoustics, and that's causing a whole bunch of acoustic events, and you're interpreting that as speech. So one of the things that you could say happens in the perception of speech is just you're just doing acoustic pattern matching. You're taking the frequencies that are coming out of my mouth, you're matching them to patterns, and you're saying, I understand what it is that she's saying. Right? And there's a lot of evidence that that is what humans do. We have an auditory canal, we have a bone chain, those amplify some of the frequencies coming out of my mouth. We have a cochlea that has hair cells that vibrate in sympathy to those frequencies, that um, is connected to some auditory nerves that tells our brain which frequencies are being created. And magically, somehow, if you hear a 300 hertz and a 21 hertz, <coughs> Frequency set, you say, she just produced E, right? So we could say, we're just matching acoustics, and there's no reason why Siri can't do that, there's no reason why Alexa can't do that. Speech recognition should be a breeze. Well, it turns out there's a lot more that goes into it, and that's what I'll try to convince you of today. So we'll start with this quick little experiment. So we'll let the sky play again, and what is it, what is it that you're hearing? Okay. Ba. 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 All right, stop for one sec. All right, we're going to play it one more time, but what I want you to do this time is close your eyes. All right, close your eyes, and here we go again. Ba. 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 Okay, you can open your eyes. So what happened when your eyes were closed? Your wallet is gone. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but what happened is you're, you were, when your eyes were closed, doing acoustic pattern matching. You were taking the acoustics, and your brain was saying, match those to a pattern. I hear ba. But when your eyes were open, what was happening was you were also taking visual cues in. In a nutshell, this is called the McGurk effect. And in a nutshell, this is just your visual cortex messing with your audio cortex. So what I'll do for the rest of the day is try, or the rest of my, well, not the rest of the day, you only have to stay 15 minutes. <laughs> what I'll do for the, for the rest of my little time here is to try to convince you that when the whole cerebral cortex gets involved, it's a mess. It's a big mess, but it's a useful mess. All right, so let's go on to this next thing. This is easy. What's the past tense of, how do you make a verb past tense in English? ED, of course, ED. What about spoken English? What do you add? Duh. You add duh, right? Hug. Past tense, hugged. What do you add to kiss? Are you adding a D? You're adding a T, right? What are you adding to wade? Ud. You're adding ud. So you have duh, t, ud. All right? So it's not ED, it's actually at least three, it's actually a couple more, but we're gonna stick with these three right now. So maybe what's happening is you memorize every verb in the English language and you memorize every single past tense that goes with those particular verbs. But if I give you words you've never heard before, each one of you is going to say the exact same thing about what the past tense of English is. So the past tense of MIP is MIBD, MIBD, sorry, MIBD. Past tense of neep, with a T. Past tense of dut, da did. All right, you all knew this, all right? So this is something that you know about language that you didn't even know that you knew. Unless you think this is a little weird thing with the past tense, same exact thing happens with the plural. You all know the plural of English. In English, is to make a noun plural, you just add a S. What about, what do you add to a cat? S, cat, sure. What about dogs? That's a Z. And in fact, most of the time when you make a noun plural, you add a Z. 
All right, so you think it's an S, but it's actually a Z. And then to fish, I don't want to hear fish is the plural of fish is fish. <laughs> it's like fish is, right? And then you add uz, right? All right, so we have s, z, z. I mean uz, s, z, uz, all right? And again, if I give you words that you've never heard before, you're all going to do the exact same thing. All right, so the first little thing that's happening here is in our conscious mind, we're sort of oversimplifying things. We're saying, at some level, we know that when we have to add an alveolar to a verb that ends in a voiced sound, add a D, voices, add a T. Uh, if it's another alveolar, add a, no, just make it ud. All right. Same, there's, there's a really set of complex rules that tells us the plural. No, let's just simplify it and say that it's S. So one of the things that our brain does is takes this really complex system and simplifies it. What do we do with the speech recognition system? Well, we find a linguist and we say, help us with these rules that are in people's heads that they don't know that are there because we're going to need them to make our automated speech recognition system work well. All right, let's do another little test here. I'm going to just say a phrase. What's the phrase that I'm saying? The last speech. So the last speech. Right. Well, we're at a TED Talk. So what you probably heard me say was the last speech. All right. But if we were driving down the coast and I said this is the last speech, you wouldn't hear it as speech. You would hear it as beach. Acoustically, the last speech and the last speech are exactly the same. They're articulatorily the same, so they're acoustically the same. And what you do is you use the context to help you figure out whether you heard beach or you heard speech. All right? We do this all the time. Can we build this into a speech recognition system? Sure. There are probability trees or decision trees that people are trying to build into systems saying, if these set of words are recognized, then it's more likely that this word is this and not this. So it's harder. It's more complex. But we can build that into the system. All right. So you guys don't have a problem with this because you understand that context is going to mean that I'm likely to say the next speech if we're here at a TED Talk. And unless I've been nagging you the whole way down our lovely drive of the coast, you're going to hear it as the last beach and not the last speech. All right. What else goes into this? All right. In the 1950s, people started using kind of old-timey speech synthesis to do experiments on the human perceptual system. One of the things that they did was they realized that they could change the precept of what vowel somebody was hearing by manipulating a certain <coughs> set of things. So one of the things that vowels, what vowels are basically just kind of categorical boundaries in this big blob of acoustic space. So e -ow -ow -ow. that's just all a blob of a bunch of different acoustics, based, um, almost an infinite amount of different acoustic patterns are showing up. But your brain says, divide the acoustic pie a certain way. But the frequencies that come out of my vocal tract are going to be very different from the frequencies that come out of somebody else's vocal tract. It's completely <laughs> dependent on the size of your mouth, the size of your larynx, how long your vocal tract is. What kind of what your teeth are like? All all these kinds of things affect the frequencies. So somehow we have to figure out a way as a human perceiver to make sense of this. And one of the things it turns out that people do is they pay attention to what the range of frequencies are that are coming out of their interlocutor's mouth. So they synthesized with their old timey synthesizer the word bet. All right. If you have a vowel that's sort of midway between bit and bet, you want to see what people are going to perceive. And it turns out if you put this word in the end of a sentence that has the top frequencies, people are going to say, I hear bet. But if instead you have the bottom set of frequencies, people are going to say, I hear bit. All right? In other words, what people do is they calibrate their interlocutor's vocal space. They say, here's the frequencies that I hear. And now I'm going to contextualize all the vowels that they come out based on what I have calibrated for them. There's been lots of studies since the 50s with much better synth uh, speech synthesis showing exactly this. So one of the things you do is you just say, I hear somebody, and now I'm going to do some calculations and use that information 
for how I interpret everything else that they say. We can build this into a synthesizer too. It's a little trickier. But we can just have the synthes I mean, I'm sorry, the a recognizer. We can have the recognizer get the range of the pitch that somebody is producing and, and we can work that into our calculations. Do we do this at another level? Sure. One of the things that happens is for most people, males have longer vocal tracts and longer, longer vocal cords than females. What they have found in a lot of different studies is that just seeing a face that looks female, that people have identified as female or people have identified as male, changes the precept of certain things. To give you one example, the difference between sip and ship, so the difference between s and sh, is just where that band of white noise is. For s, it's in higher frequencies. For sh, it's in lower frequencies. If I synthesize a token that's halfway between sip and ship, I can try to figure out what it is people are going to do with that. And one of the things that happens is if they think they're listening to a female, they say, oh, that's ship. If they think the very same signal is a, coming out of a male mouth, they say, oh, that's sip. In other words, even before people have heard the frequencies coming out of their interlocutor's mouths, they've made some decisions about what kind of things will come out of that person's mouth. In, order, in other words, they sort of pre-calibrate. And they do this with kids, because kids are going to have even smaller vocal tracts, smaller vocal cords, higher frequencies. They tend to look at people's height. They tend to look at all kinds of different things about their interlocutor before they even open their mouths. All right? Can we build this into a synthesizer? Sure. I mean, I'm sorry, I keep saying synthesizer. Recognizer, speech recognition system. Can we build this in? Yes. But the ramifications of this have been that for the first several decades of work on automated speech recognition, male voices were recognized much better than female voices, leading one of my colleagues to say in the early 90s, I don't know what it is about women. They just can't seem to be recognized by our machines. <laughs> I know. I know what it is. <laughs> So in any case, you, we, we've fixed some of this now. So in the decades since it started, we've fixed some of this. All right? But here's where it gets even more tricky if you're building an automated speech recognition system. We interact with people with all kinds of different dialects. So to give you an example, in Houston, some people have merged it and a in front of nasals. In other words, pin and pin are homophones. You stick with a pin, you write with a pin. Other people have that as two separate, phone, uh, two separate lexical items, pin, pen. Right? Who says pin, pen? Who says pin, pen? Well, one of the things we know is that for Anglos, older people are more likely to say pin, pin. Younger people are more likely to say pin, pen. Do people know this? Well, if you do a perceptual test and you use something uh, like rinse and rinse will also be homonyms. If you have this merger, they won't if you don't. So you're either rinse and rinse or rinse and rinse. If I do a perceptual test where I ask somebody to choose what they're hearing, but I've hooked them up to an eye tracker, one of the things I'm, I might be interested in is where their eyes are going. Well, if I put the picture of the older lady in the middle and say, this is who you're listening to, it turns out that people's eyes sort of move back and forth between rinse and rinse. If, on the other hand, I put the younger picture in there, their eyes go right to rinse. In other words, you might not have known this at a conscious level, but people react as if this information is in their heads. I have an idea that older people are more likely, older white people are more likely to merge this, and younger white people are more likely to not, so I'm going to use that information. All right? <clears throat> what do we do with this with a the, with the, uh, recognizer? I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. But let me give you one more example. What else can we use? Well, there is a feature of almost every dialect of American English that says, instead of saying an alveolar stop at the end of the word, I can replace that with a glottal stop. So instead of saying what, I can say what. So I didn't bring my tongue up to my alveolar ridge in the second one. In the first one, I went what and bring, brought my tongue to the, my alveolar ridge. In the second one, what, I just closed my glottis. But you probably all interpreted the second one as what. So 
I guess all of the people of American English got together and said, what, how about if we just say that the glottal can stand in for the alveolar if it's a T? And, ah, okay, well, we'll let that go. So then what happened was all of the white people left the room and there are some African Americans that stayed back and said, you know what, D is also an alveolar. So how about if we make not only the T stand in for the alveolar uh, for the glottal, with the glottal stop, but also D. So good is interpreted as good, but so is good. If I stop things at the alveolar ridge, I mean at, at my glottis, that can still stand in for a D. Let's do that. That is just this, taking this same rule, just pushing it one step farther. Okay, that sounds good. Should we tell the white people? No, they'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turns out they didn't figure it out. So, whoa. This set should be over there. If we ask people whether they've heard the word, what word they've heard, and we play set, okay, for the Anglos, that can only be S-E-T. For the African Americans, that could be S-E-T or S-A-I-D. If we put the dude on the right in the middle and say, this is who you're listening to, people pick set. If we have the dude on the left and say, this is who you're listening to, people pick either said or set. All right. So this is probably a rule that you're not aware. You, if, if I ask you what people do with uh, alveolar stops, if I ask you what the difference is between African American and European, European American English, you might not say this, but it turns out people know this at some level. So what do we do with our speech recognition system? We kind of say, uh, this is, th there's no way we can really build this into the model except to say some people might do this and some people might do this. All right? So perceived age of the speaker influences how we perceive things. Perceived ethnicity, so does gender, lines on a map and perceived disability. And those three last ones are in red because we've done some experiments showing that in fact those things can even override the acoustic signal. I did a lot of work with my um, people I grew up with in Michigan because one of the things that I found interesting was a lot of Canadian things that people were associating with Canada were creeping into Anglo speech in Michigan. But the Michiganders were blissfully unaware of this. So I had some lines and I, th that were produced by a woman from Detroit. I played them for Michiganders, and I said, I'm creating a spe speech synthesizer. Help me pick out the, the vowels that you hear. If they thought she was from Michigan, they did horribly. Why did they do horribly? Because Michiganders think that they are producing speech the way this was done back in the day, Walter Cronkite talks or newscasters talk, when in fact there's a huge vowel shift that's happening in the northern cities, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, places like that. They're blissfully unaware of this, though. They don't realize that this has taken place. If, on the other hand, I lie to my respondents and say, this woman is from Windsor, Ontario, then they hear exactly what it is that she's doing. So their belief that Michiganders use perfectly correct English overrides the acoustics. I call this filtering out some of the acoustic signal. The same thing, unfortunately, happens with uh, speech therapists. One of the things that can happen if you have had a cleft palate is you can have what's called hypernasality. And it turns out that if you show a picture of a client to a speech therapist and say, diagnose the degree of hypernasality in this person, they'll rate it as higher if they think the person has a cleft palate versus if they don't. I actually have a student right now that's working on now augmenting what speech therapists do with actually speech recognition because that's one place that speech recognition can help. It can help make sure that it's an objective measure of hypernasality versus subjective. All right. Now what happens with the Michiganders? They're just out of luck. They're just going to blissfully go along thinking they all sound like Walter Cronkite or Justin Bieber or something like that. All right. <laughs> so just to finish up here, we have this big, great um, uh, cerebral cortex, and we just use it. Why do we use it? Well, we listen to speech in noisy environments. All of the acoustics that are happening from the lights, from the air conditioning, can mask some of the things coming out of my mouth. So what happens is we use other things. We use context. We use vision. We use everything in order to 
help us make sense of what our interlocutors are saying. We listen to people with all different dialects, so we have to kind of have some ideas about how these dialects work. We listen to people who don't perform speech necessarily the way that the dictionary says to do it or that they were taught from their English teachers, so we have to have a way of making sense of that. And what we do is we engage our entire cerebral cortex so that if I say the end or the end or the end, Every child knows that the last one means that the talk is over, but the cyborg with the automated speech recognition system in their head shut down 20 seconds ago. <laughs> Thank you very much.